I'm going to speak to you for a minute tonight, folks. I've, uh, my heart started racing again last night, about 8 o'clock. And uh, I went to the doctor this morning. They've got me on a medication supposed to slow it down. So uh, I uh, didn't get any sleep at all last night. None. You don't get any sleep when your heart does that. And uh, I'm, pretty t I'm pretty tired and weak. But I'm going to didn't have time to get anybody else, so I'm going to give you a little bit out of the Scripture tonight, and then I'll be done. If you'll turn to Hebrews chapter number 12 with me, please. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, what that does is prepare you for the uh, remainder of the book of Hebrews. And it's, it's a, a contrast with what you've read in chapter number 11 of all these uh, saints of faith. And we know that without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so he's going to try your faith. He'll try you. And when he does that, he does that to uh, better you and reveal himself to you in greater ways. In Hebrews 12, though, he said that we are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. Now I want you to look on over here in uh, chapter number 12 and verse number 22. In Hebrews 12, 22, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, yes. Amen. unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, which are, uh, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of, of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now that's a contrast with, uh, in uh, verse number 18, for ye are not come to the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the words should not be spoken to them anymore. They couldn't take that because God was speaking and manifesting himself in holiness. And when he gave the law, he gave the law in holiness. And you can never draw near to God in holiness. You have to have an intermediary, a substitute, a way to approach God because he is absolutely untouchable and unapproachable, but you can through Christ. Because that's why it says that we are come not to the mountain that could not be touched, but you are come to Mount Zion Amen. and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. It's all of grace and it's all an invitation. As a matter of fact, the book of Hebrews is loaded with invitations. I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not, but from chapter number one all the way through the 13th chapter, one invitation after another invitation after another invitation, it's full of invitations. And when God invites someone, he has a reason for that because you have a will and he won't violate your will. And you've got to remember, you've got to remember that you're going to make a choice whether you serve him or not. And if you refuse to serve him, then uh, you've chosen by your will to reject him. And you don't serve him just because the circumstances are good and you're on the mountain. You serve him in the valley too. And you serve him when the circumstances are not good because he's the same Lord, regardless of whether you're on the mountain or you're in the valley. He's a good God, but first he has to teach us lessons because of our fallen nature and because of the hardness of our hearts and because of our natural inclination to drift away from him. And so therefore he has to prepare us and teach us lessons that we have to learn. Lessons not something you learn intellectually, a lesson is something that you've learned in your heart and it affects your life. Until then, you haven't learned it. But he's telling us that you have an opportunity to come to one who will spread before you a table that's set and allow you to sit at that table, as he did Mephibosheth, and let you come into the king's house and eat the king's fare. The Lord will do that for you. Satan will blind your eyes to that simple truth. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. And what he blinds them to is the goodness of God. 
The Apostle Paul in one of his epistles talks about the people of the world, how that they hate each other, and they do. They're motivated by hate and greed. They're motivated by all the works of the flesh. That's what they're motivated by. That's what they live by. And they feed off of each other. And just as soon as, uh, as one or the other is not uh, beneficial to them, out the door with them. While they would kill each other in a, heart, in a heartbeat. But that's not so for the church of the living God. Oh, no, no, no. When you try to bring into the church the same spirit that the world has, it won't work. The Holy Spirit will not sanction it. He will not put His approval upon it. The Bible said the fruit of the Spirit, the first fruit of the Spirit. Somebody tell me what it is tonight. Exactly. Love. And by this He said, shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. And the Apostle John in 1 John uses the term love over and over again to define in real terms what it means to love the brethren. And one of them is that you can lay down your life for your brother. So, uh, you know, this, uh, this, the church is not built upon business principles. It's certainly not built upon the spirit of this world, the uh, spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience, the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air. That's not what the church is built upon. The church is built upon the love of Christ. It's not some fanciful love that you create, manufacture, fantasize in your mind what it means. It's the love of Christ. The love of Christ, the apostle says, constraineth me. And the love of Christ is, is past his understanding. Not that we loved him, but he loved us first. And so in order to be able to come to what he offers here, you can't come to it in the flesh. In other, in other words, to come to this Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, an innumerable company of angels, these are all spiritual truths that are revealed to our heart and we can receive them, but we can only receive them as we are prepared spiritually to be able to do that. The spiritual things are the great things. They're the good things. They're the better things. They're the eternal things. The things of this world and the fleshly things are here today and they're gone tomorrow. A little dazzling show for a while, but then it quickly fades. It's like the grass of the field, here and gone. But these eternal truths that he gives to us, he says these are the things, in verse 24, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. He's offering us this mediatorship of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's offering him and his blood atonement, the blood of Christ, in order for us to have a relationship with God. And there's no other way to have a relationship with the Lord, except like that, only through the blood and only through Christ. And the Lord Jesus tasted, the Bible said, by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Yes. You and for me, that means that he tasted your sin debt. He paid for your sin. That's what that means. Death is the consequence of sin. Death is the ultimate payment for sin. So if he by the grace of God should taste death for every man, that means that he tasted the, the adulterer's death. He tasted the murderer's death. He tasted, he tasted the death of the, of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of the worst and heinous that ever walked the face of this earth. He tasted their death. He tasted their death. And that was part of his qualifications in his high priesthood because now he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You... All people don't come to the Lord the same way. They don't come, but they, they come to the same Lord. Some people come to the Lord a hard way. They have to be beaten to death. They, they have to lose everything. They have to literally uh, be in a hog pen and, look, and look at the only place left to look is up. They have, to, they have to be faced with their sin, some people do. Other people, by wisdom and by the grace of God, the light comes on. And before they've gone that far in it, they can come to Him Amen. and they can receive Him. Uh, but they don't all come the same way, but they come to the same one. That's the thing. That's the issue tonight. You don't, you don't have to go around and find somebody that was saved exactly the way you are. You know, that, in other words, they, they may not have the same type of testimony you have, but they believe in the same Lord you believe in. That's all that matters. That's all that matters is that you believe in the same Lord you, that you've received Him and that He's your God. And I praise God for that tonight. And I thank the Lord for giving me strength. Amen. Amen. You wouldn't believe how weak you get when your heart rate is running away. And I thank the good Lord tonight for that. I ask you to do this. Would you please pray for me that I'm on this medication supposed to slow my heart rate down. And I've got this surgery coming up Monday and, uh, for my kidney. And uh, just uh, pray 
that the good Lord, but he has. He's made himself known to me. I was lying in bed last night with my heart just pounding away, running about 138 beats a minute, just pounding away. And I said, Lord, I'm going to turn over here and try to sleep. And if you take me home tonight, fine. If not, that's fine too. I didn't sleep, but I had peace. I had complete, absolute peace. Now, there is nothing on this earth better than that. Nothing. Believe me, there is nothing. And you'll never know what that is until you think you're going to die. And then when you think you're going to die, and uh, you'll find out how you'll react at that moment. You'd be surprised at how many people are literally terrorized with the thought of dying, yet they'll do nothing about it. They'll do nothing about it. They just put it out of their mind like it's not going to happen. Father, in thy name we pray. Thank you for being with me tonight. Thank you for the sweet Holy Ghost. Thank you for confirming your word one more time. So I stand up and I give it forth to the people. Lord, may they hear it tonight and may they act upon it. And I know it will not return void. I know it will accomplish the thing that you please and it will prosper in the thing whereto you've sent it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I've got a prayer request up here tonight.